Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Brian Shapiro, a technical writer at ATCC. Thank you for joining us for the latest installment in the ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series entitled Cell Line Contamination, Mycoplasma Prevention and Detection, presented by Ms. Balsam Shockey and Dr. Reed Shadman. Ms. Shockey is a senior biologist with extensive experience in cell authentication and molecular biology. At ATCC, she's instrumental in the development of new cell authentication services focused on mycoplasma detection. Dr. Shabman is a lead scientist with extensive familiarity with research conducted in biocontainment facilities and advanced knowledge of planning and executing biodefense studies. At ATCC, he works in a team that provides custom cell and microbial services to both private and public entities. In today's webinar, Ms. Shockey and Dr. Shabman will discuss the history of mycoplasma contamination with a focus on current prevention and detection methods. They will also expand on the products and services offered by ATCC for routine mycoplasma testing, highlighting our new PCR-based mycoplasma detection service. If you have any questions for our speakers, please use the chat function available through the webinar program. Questions will be answered as time allows at the end of the presentation, and any remaining questions as well as the recorded webinar presentation, will be archived on the ATCC website at www.atcc.org slash webinars on demand. So with that, I would like to welcome Ms. Shockey. Thanks, Brian, for the introduction, and welcome to our webinar. Our agenda today is to first give a little background on our organization and on mycoplasma bacteria. We will also take a look at the history of mycoplasma contamination and sources of contamination, how to protect your cells and cell culture through laboratory prevention techniques and detection methods. We will also cover eradication methods that can be used to help eliminate contamination from your culture. The American Type Culture Collection was founded in 1925. We are a nonprofit organization with our headquarters in Manassas, Virginia, and an R&D location in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Our brand name is worldwide with thousands of cell lines and microbes. ATCC collaborates with and supports the scientific community with industry standard and innovative biological solutions. We have a growing portfolio of products and services and sales and distribution in over 140 countries with 15 international distributors. We are a team of over 475 employees and our facilities, facilities have multiple accreditations, including ISO 9001 and 17025. So a little bit of background on mycoplasma. They are bacteria, classes molecules due to their lack of cell wall. They do have a simple cell wall, as you can see in the figure, a lipoprotein membrane. They are also very small in size. In fact, the smallest known my mycoplasma bacteria is the species Mycoplasma genitalium. Mycoplasmas need to feed off of their host cells and require the presence of several catabolites, like cholesterol and vitamins, to survive. You can see a depiction of a mycoplasma bacterium in the figure here on the right. Mycoplasma infection not only affects cell cultures, but is also associated with human and animal disease. In humans, mycoplasmas are common in the respiratory and urogenital tracts and cause diseases like pneumonia and pelvic inflammatory disease. Mycoplasmas can also infect animals, as the photo on the right depicts an infected hamster lung. Note the gross anatomy of a healthy lung in photo A compared to photos B through D as they show the progression of the mycoplasma infection. There are over 190 known mycoplasma species, 
but only the eight listed here are responsible for about 95% of all cell culture contaminations. So what are the scientific impacts of mycoplasma contamination? Once mycoplasmas infect your culture, they compete with the host cells for nutrients, and this can cause many of the damaging effects listed here. Contamination can cause chromosomal aberrations, disrupt nucleic acid synthesis, inhibit cell proliferation and metabolism, decrease transfection rates, and even cell death. Since the bacteria cannot be visualized by the naked eye or a standard microscope, these changes may go undetected for some time. As you can see in the hoax stain image, the small stains on the left show a mycoplasma infected cell line, while the photo on the right shows a mycoplasma free cell line. In addition to the scientific impacts of mycoplasma contamination, there is also an impact to the biopharmaceutical industry. For years, cell lines have been used to produce a number of biological products for therapeutic or medicinal use, including viral vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. Because of the damaging effects that mycoplasma strains have on cell lines, mycoplasma contamination in the biopharmaceutical industry presents a significant safety and economic risk. As the figure depicts, and as discussed in the paper cited below, if the mycoplasma contaminant is present in the final biological product, it can directly affect patient safety through the potential to cause disease. Furthermore, there can be a product loss and a decrease in product quality. On an economic level, mycoplasma contamination can result in significant costs in the time and expense associated with the loss of impacted batches. In turn, this can result in the loss of months of invaluable production time and thousands of dollars in associated expenses. I will now turn it over to Dr. Shabman for a historical overview of mycoplasma contamination and ways to prevent contamination of your cells. Thanks, Balsam. So as Balsam mentioned, I will now give a historical overview of mycoplasma contamination. And here, I summarize historical findings that highlight the need for mycoplasma testing. In addition to their impact on human health, mycoplasmas are widespread contaminants of cell culture. In 1956, researchers from Johns Hopkins reported mycoplasma contamination of HeLa cells used in their lab. By the early 1990s, the US Food and Drug Administration had tested over 20,000 cultures and found 15% contaminated with mycoplasma. A study in 1991 from Argentina found 70% of 200 samples tested were mycoplasma contaminated. Furthermore, more recently in 2002, a report by DSMZ in Germany found 28% of 440 lines tested were contaminated. Hence, mycoplasma contamination in cell culture is a long-standing and persistent problem. The image on the right indicates three T6 cells, which are both mycoplasma-free and mycoplasma-infected. Fast forward to 2015. The advancement of new technology, such as next generation sequencing, allows us to survey mycoplasma contamination from cell culture in novel ways. And this was highlighted by a recent study which analyzed public data for mycoplasma contamination. So what we're highlighting on the left is a published study in nucleic acids research, which assesses the prevalence of mycoplasma contamination in cell culture by a survey of NCBI's RNA-seq archive. High throughput RNA sequencing data is grown at an exponential rate and is providing an unprecedented view of the constituency of RNA molecules in a sample. The authors predicted that mycoplasma sequences in RNA-seq data from primate and rodent specimens would be indicative of contamination. This study identified the presence of mycoplasma in public data sets. Their analysis of the next generation sequencing data from the public domain identified that 884 of 9,395 samples examined, or 11%, contain mycoplasma specific reads. Representative data from the report to the right illustrates publications from high impact journals that used mycoplasma contaminated data sets. And I'd just like to highlight that some of these journals have been cited uh, over 100 times and are of high impact journals going from Nature Biotechnology, Cell, and Cancer Cell. So how do you get mycoplasma contamination in the lab? Well, here we highlight some common sources of mycoplasma contamination. 
One of the most common ways to get mycoplasma contamination is through personnel and equipment. This can result from poor culture practices, as well as dust and aerosols. Cross-contamination is also a contributor. Examples include aerosol dispersion of contaminated cell cultures, or broken or faulty laminar flow hood. In addition, cell culture reagents can also contribute to mycoplasma contamination, and these can include sera, media, and reagents. How do you protect from mycoplasma contamination in cell culture? We're briefly going to discuss uh, some key approaches, both prevention and testing. Let's first touch on prevention. To both avoid and control the spread of mycoplasma contamination during cell culture, we recommend the following laboratory practices. Use proper aseptic techniques and practices. Wear personal protective equipment, or PPE, and work in a vertical laminar flow hood. Always quarantine any new cell lines of origin. And if you're going to use antibiotics, use antibiotics responsibly. Avoid the imminent indiscriminate use of these antibiotics as you can often generate antibiotic resistant bacteria within your culture. And finally, it's always important to, pre to prevent uh, mycoplasma contamination by employing good cell banking practices. So for example, only work with one cell lot at a time and ensure that all media, sera, and reagents are obtained from mycoplasma free sources. We'll next introduce routine testing methods required to protect from mycoplasma contamination. So why is routine testing important? Well, mycoplasma contamination is not easily detected. It does not cause media turbidity. It does not alter the pH of the media. It, pro it produces few metabolic byproducts, and it cannot be easily detected by microscopy. For this reason, three common testing methods are recommended. There's the direct agriculture, the indirect hoaxed DNA stain, and the PCR-based test. Let's look at each one of these tests in more detail. First, let's start with the direct agriculture. The direct agriculture method uses both broth and agar. This permits the isolation of cultible strains as apparent by the appearance of characteristic mycoplasma colonies on the agar medium. In brief, two agars and one broth tube are inoculated for each sample. Samples are incubated and subcultured, and subcultured for specific days after inoculation. Results are read separately by two individuals. After the required incubation period, the auger plates are observed for the presence of mycoplasma colonies. For this test, there are several advantages. These advantages include that the direct agriculture is considered the gold standard for testing. It's easy to perform, it, pre it detects viable cells, and it meets the FDA points to consider recommendations. Disadvantages include the fact that, that the assay is time, time intensive, it's laborious, not all mycoplasma are culturable in vitro. This may require expert interpretation, and it often requires selective media. The second test we're going to discuss is the indirect culture method, or the indirect hoax DNA stain. This culture method makes use of the binding properties of fluorochrome hoax DNA. The stain will bind DNA of mycoplasma in infected organisms which can be easily detected using a microscope equipped with appropriate fluorescent optics. And for this assay, Vero cells are commonly used as a control cell line. The way the assay works is when we'll prepare a sample and culture medium, prepare a DNA stain and fixative solutions, staining of chamber slides, and then after staining, the, the individuals will read the slides, and these results are read by two separate individuals. Again, for this test, there are both advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of this test is that it's easy to, report, easy to perform, there's a rapid analysis, and it's extremely cost effective. Disadvantages include uh, interpretation of results can be challenging. The stain stains all nucleic acids, so you can't differentiate between eukaryotes and prokaryotes, and you can't differentiate between mycoplasma and other bacteria. So the example picture on the right illustrates uh, the host nucleus stained, as well as mycoplasma contamination in the, in the cytoplasm. Finally, we'll discuss PCR-based methods. An alternative approach to identifying mycoplasma contamination is through PCR-based testing, which has proven to be a rapid and reliable alternative when validated as, as a comparable method of detection. This molecular-based assay is ideal for research laboratories, as it's easy and quick to set up and analyze. 
Currently, many PCR-based methods are designed to amplify the conserved 16S ribosomal RNA region of the mycoplasma genome. To ensure the specificity of this method, primers are broad enough to recognize mycoplasma species, as well as specific enough to prevent the amplification of 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequences belonging to other non-mycoplasma bacterial contaminants. ATCC currently offers PCR-based mycoproducts and services, which Balsam will discuss later. Along with the direct and indirect test, there are several advantages and disadvantages to PCR-based mycoplasma testing. For one, this assay is extremely easy to perform. It's reproducible. It's highly sensitive and specific. It's efficient, and it can be very cost-effective. Disadvantages include the fact that it cannot distinguish between viable and non-viable cells, unlike the direct auger assay. It requires primers that are broad enough to amplify different mycoplasma, but it's specific enough not to amplify other bacterial contaminants. And the assay can often require optimization. So now I'm going to hand the webinar back over to Balsam, who's going to talk to you a bit about ATCC products and services. Let's take a look at the products and services offered by ATCC to detect mycoplasma contamination. We offer all three types of mycoplasma detection methods that my colleague, Dr. Shabman, presented. We have the direct and indirect culture testing, which is offered as a bundled service. The direct culture uses both broth and auger, and the indirect culture is a hoax DNA stain. Our newest service offering is a PCR-based testing service, where cells are spotted on FTA paper and processed in our lab using ATCC's mycoplasma detection kit. The mycoplasma detection kit can also be purchased as a product on our website. The researcher can then run the assay in his or her own lab. Let's take a look at all, the, all of these services in more detail. As mentioned, our bundled direct and indirect culture testing meets the FDA points to consider requirements. This is a great option if you need to meet this level of stringency for testing. It is easy to schedule a test through our website with one of our customer support specialists. For this type of testing, we do need live culture flasks to be submitted. The steps required to submit a flask can be found on our website. Since the cells will need to be grown for this service, results will be obtained within four to five weeks. Here's a screenshot of an indirect culture sample report. The direct, cultures, the, the, the direct culture report is very similar to this one, and both reports are emailed to the customer. The top of the report will include all of the order information, including the customer name, organization, and dates when testing was initiated and results were obtained. In the results table below, results for four controls and the customer's sample are listed. The controls include a negative, mycoplasma-free culture, two mycoplasma-infected cell lines, and one mycoplasma bacteria. Additional notes on the test and two expert signatures are also included at the bottom of the report. Our newest service offering is a PCR-based mycoplasma testing service that was just launched in March of this year. Our PCR-based service is a great option for routine testing. For this service, sample cells are spotted and shipped on an FTA card, shown here on the top right. FTA paper contains chemicals that lyse cells on contact, tightly bind and protect DNA from degradation, and prevent bacterial growth. The cards are a great alternative to sending in pellets or flasks, as they provide for, for easy sample handling and shipping. This PCR-based service is cer certified under ISO 17025, and utilizes our mycoplasma detection kit, pictured on the bottom right. The PCR-based service can also be ordered through our website. Step one is to place an order and receive the FTA kit. The kit contains an FTA card, a sample submission form, and a pre-addressed return envelope. The card and the submission form will also have a unique barcode number to identify and track your sample through our laboratory. Once the kit is received, 
Step two is to complete the submission form shown here on the bottom right, which will capture the customer's information. The form also describes step-by-step -step sample preparation instructions to spot your cells, seen here on the top right. Once cells are, sp once cells are spotted on the card, they are left to dry, and step three is to ship them back to ATCC in the pre-addressed envelope. You will then receive an email notification once the card is received in the laboratory, which means processing has begun. Results are then sent out within three to five business days to the email address provided in the submission form. Here's a sample of a mycoplasma PCR testing report. It is similar to the culture reports and contains all the order information, including the FTA barcode number, customer name and organization, cell line name, and processing dates. The report also gives the customer some information on the testing service and includes a table of results for controls and the sample submitted. Test results are also explained with additional biologist comments if needed. Report, reports are always reviewed and signed by two experts to confirm results. Lastly, another option for testing is to run ATCC's mycoplasma detection kit in your own laboratory. The kit is ideal for research laboratories as it is easy and quick to set up and analyze. It is highly sensitive and specific and fairly cost effective to run. The primers are designed to amplify the conserved 16S rRNA region of the mycoplasma genome and can detect over 60 species of mycoplasma. All components of the PCR reaction are provided and optimized for amplification, including the lysis buffer, primers, and positive control. Once cells are, are, once cells are grown in the lab, they are scraped and transferred to a sample lysis tube. The cells are then spun down and the pellet can either be stored to run the assay at a later time or lysis buffer is added and the sample is incubated. Once incubation is complete, the cells, the cells are spun down and the, the cell lysate now contains DNA to be used in the PCR reaction. A touchdown PCR reaction is employed and the products can then be visualized on an electrophoresis gel. A positive mycoplasma result will show a distinct band around the 464 base pair region. Here, I would like to review a sensitivity study that was completed in-house to compare ATCC's mycoplasma detection kit to three other PCR-based kits. A dilution series was tested of BHK cells infected with mycoplasma orale to detect 500,000 cells per mil down to five cells per mil. The gels shown are from ATCC's mycoplasma detection kit and supplier number one. Suppliers two and three required an instrument for assay readout. Their results are summarized in the table. As shown in the left gel, a distinct band was easily visualized in all samples when using the ATCC mycoplasma detection kit. Using the PCR kit from supplier one gave less intense bands at all dilutions tested, shown in the gel on the right. The instrumentation-based assays provided by suppliers two and three were much less sensitive, as you can see on the, on the right-hand side of the table, unable to detect down to the 50 and five cells, five cells per mil level. The ATCC mycoplasma detection kit is more sensitive when directly compared to other suppliers. So what are the benefits of using ATCC's culture and PCR-based mycoplasma detection service? We have been providing our mycoplasma detection kit since 2010, and it is now being used to run our PCR-based testing service. We also have multiple years of experience in performing the direct and indirect mycoplasma testing assays to meet FDA points to consider requirements. Both our culture-based and PCR-based assays are used in-house to confirm all of our products and micro, all of our products are mycoplasma free prior to distribution. 
We are an accredited laboratory and all of our services are also accredited under ISO 17025. To learn more about our mycoplasma testing services and order testing, our website lists both services and provides a great summary of each test method, processing and delivery times, and the advantages of each service. I will now transition to my colleague, Dr. Chapman, who will present methods on eradicating mycoplasma and conclude our webinar. Thanks, Balsam. For the last part of the webinar, I'd like to briefly discuss recommendations for eradicating mycoplasma contamination. ATCC has historically provided recommendations for eliminating mycoplasma, and here I highlight a review published in 1989, written by ATCC, when the facility was located in Rockville, Maryland. Even almost 30 years ago, the recommendation was to discard cultures when possible. So to directly read the abstract, mycoplasma contamination is tough to detect and even more difficult to eradicate. It's best to start over from fresh clean stocks, but several elimination options are available. And that message in 1989 still rings true today. So if you have contamination, what should you discard? Well, you should consider discarding all of your cell culture, destroy contaminated cell cultures. We'll, talk, we'll discuss antibiotic therapies in a minute, uh, but you would also want to acquire fresh cells. Destroy all of your medias, destroy contaminated media, Going forward, use media guaranteed to be mycoplasma free and always sterilize media via filtration or UV radiation. Finally, in the laboratory, it's always important to disinfect all laboratory surfaces and equipment, such as biosafety cabinets, incubators, water baths, and laboratory benches after you've detected mycoplasma contamination. Sometimes you have cell cultures that are too valuable or difficult to replace. In this scenario, there are chemical agents that can be used to eliminate mycoplasma infection. So for example, you're culturing primary cells and there's no simple way to replace the material. In this scenario, one would recommend using antibiotics to try to remove mycoplasma contamination. So tetracycline and macrolide antibiotics can remove mycoplasma from cell culture. These include BM cycline, a combination of two compounds which inhibit bacterial protein synthesis, as well as plasmacin, which contains bacterial cytal components that affect protein synthesis and DNA replication. If you must use antibiotics, a recommended workflow is illustrated to the right. So say you have a mycoplasma positive cell line that you would like to try to clean from contamination. The first step would be to secure mycoplasma positive aliquots as frozen backups. Then proceed with an antibiotic treatment, such as BM cycling. After a series of uh, days in antibiotics, one would then perform mycoplasma testing. Should the mycoplasma test come back negative, continue culturing your cells in your cells and proceed as normal. However, it's important to continue to conduct routine testing over a regular basis. If the mycoplasma test comes back positive, this can be indicative of an antibiotic resistant mycoplasma population. In this scenario, when we want to evaluate a different antibiotic for treatment of this culture, repeat the treatment, consider another, another elimination method, or simply discard the culture. So that brings us to the conclusions of our webinar. So to summarize in brief, mycoplasma contamination affects roughly 15 to 35% of continuous cultures, which can result in deleterious effects. The best practices for avoiding contamination and preventing the spread of existing contamination include keeping a documented history of your cell line, following cell culture best practices, and always perform routine testing using some of the testing methods that Balsam and I discussed today. Eliminating mycoplasma infected cultures in the lab should occur quickly, and this is always the best way to prevent further contamination. Finally, direct indirect and PCR-based mycoplasma testing methods are available to ensure your cultures can be mycoplasma free. And the great news is that ATCC offers a variety of mycoplasma testing services, including a new rapid PCR-based test using FTA paper. So that brings us to the end of the webinar. And at this point, we'd like to open it up for questions and answers. Well, thank you, Reed and Balsam, for the excellent presentation. In just a few moments, we will begin our Q&A session. Please use the chat function available 
through the webinar program to submit your questions. And this session will be documented as a PDF and archived along with the recorded webinar presentation on the ATCC website at www.atcc.org slash webinars on demand. So our first question looks like a good one for uh, Dr. Chapman. Could insect, uh, insect cells such as SF9 be contaminated by mycoplasma? That's a really good question. Uh, the short answer is that all cells in culture can be contaminated by mycoplasma. And furthermore, even if the stocks are mycoplasma free, contamination can always occur due to inadequate cell culture techniques. So just because you have a cell line that's not a mammalian cell line, for example, doesn't mean that it's immune to mycoplasma contamination. Okay, um, so then uh, Reed, can you comment on using routine antimycobacteria antibiotics in media as a preventative measure? Yeah, so we talked about that at the end of the webinar. And as we mentioned, as a general rule, it's discouraged to use antibiotics in cell culture for most cases. This is because antibiotic treatment can alter physiology and cell health of cells in culture. And it can also result in antibiotic, -resist antibiotic resistant mycoplasmas. So in this scenario, you really want to prevent this use, but for certain reasons, it may be necessary. As we mentioned, you might have specific cell lines which are not easily replaced. So in this scenario, you can find additional information about the use of antibiotics and antimycotics uh, by reviewing our webinar, which we just presented, or to download um, some of our cell culture guide uh, information on, on our ATCC website. All right. Um, so what are the easiest methods and protocols used to detect mycoplasma contamination in cancer cell cultures? In cancer cell cultures? Well, I think this question, could, that's a great question. Uh, this could go beyond cancer cell cultures, but if you think about it going from uh, some the simplest test out to the more, the more robust tests, as we discussed, the mycoplasma detection kit that we have here at ATCC is one of the quickest methods to detect mycoplasma in cell culture. This entire procedure only takes about three hours in your lab. Uh, if that's something that you don't want to do or you want to trust ATCC's expertise, we also offer a PCR-based mycoplasma detection service. And that's what, that's what Balsam had just covered in the, in the webinar. Finally, there's both direct and indirect culture methods, which we discussed as well, which is also part of the ATCC um, service offering. All right. So, um... How often should testing be done? Uh, are there specific times or occasions that should be done? That's a, good, that's a very good question. Uh, according to best practices, a mycoplasma test should be done when the, with, when the original vi with the original vial, uh, if the cells are received from an unreliable source or if a master stock is to be prepared. So there's really no limit to the number of times one should perform mycoplasma testing, but it is preferable to screen your samples on a regular schedule. And this is because routine testing helps ensure that the experiments are performed in your lab are verifiable and reproducible. Okay. <laughs> All right. No, no, that, that, that sounds good. That okay. sounds good. Yep. Uh, so let me jump to a question for Balsam. Yeah. Uh, the, this looks like a good one for you. Can you comment on um, if the um, mycoplasma kit has been approved by the FDA? The mycoplasma detection kit has not been approved by FDA for biopharmaceutical use or clinical use. It is for RUO only. Okay. Okay, and um, then uh, I, I guess a, another good one, um, I, I guess to follow that up then, can the kit be used in clinical diagnostics? The mycoplasma detection kit is intended for laboratory research only. Uh, not for clinical use. Okay. All right. And then um, back to Reed. In the ATCC Universal Mycoplasma Detection Kit, do you use cell media or cell lysates for detection of mycoplasma? That's a great question. So the short answer is that the kit is sensitive enough to detect mycoplasma in just cell media. However, certain mycoplasma can directly adhere to cells, 
and this can negatively affect your detection. So we recommend that a cell lysate be used. Um, just a brief follow-up on that, our mycoplasma detection service off of FTA paper offers, uh, offers mycoplasma detection by collecting your cells and spotting those cells onto FTA paper. Um, and this would be a combination of both your media and your cells and culture. And you can find out more information about that on our, on our website. All righty, and um, back to balsam. Will the universal mycoplasma detection kit be compromised if the sample contains too many cells? That's a good question. Ideally, for both um, adherent and suspension cells, uh, the cell range should be between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 6 cells. Uh, the use of cells greater than this volume could potentially inhibit the PCR reaction. All right, well, great. Uh, at this time, we will conclude our Q&A session. Uh, I'd like to thank Ms. Shockey and Dr. Shabman for the excellent presentation. And thank you, everyone, for attending the webinar. Any questions that were not answered this afternoon will be answered and posted with the video at www.atcc.org slash webinars on demand. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.